namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Aparuta de Sangamatasa Tawara ye Sodavanta Bamujantu Satang. So this evening, opportunity to reflect, contemplate Dhamma or the, the way it is. And so the, this day has been spent mainly observing, I hope, and taking refuge in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. And so this is like reflecting on, recognize the existential reality of being a human individual. You're, you're, you're a, a one kind of separate entity in the universe. This point is, is an obvious fact, isn't it? Each one of us is, uh, has to live within the, the, the body that we've born into and we're experiencing life from this point. So this is the center point. We can see the sun is the center of the universe, but that's, in terms of the reality of now, that's the sun is, a, is we can see the sun with our eyes. Or maybe not right now, we see the sunset anyway. So the sun is in our consciousness, and the center point is, is this point here. Uh, we 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 can give uh, you know our commitment to scientific uh, 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 doctrines, teachings, and so forth because the, you know we we quite uh, they're quite skillful and good many of them. But what what I'm pointing to now is reflecting on the way it is, not on uh, not from the position of God that is the center uh, and knows everything about everything but from this position of being this mortal being sitting here. And so this is, uh, in, in terms of our reality, what we have to live with, this is, this is the center point of the universe. <clears throat> now this is not Sakya Ditti in terms of me, Ajahn Smith, I'm the center of the universe. <laughs> I mean, that, that's preposterous, but it, it's pointing to uh, a re- uh, the Dhamma, the way it is, that each one of us, each creature, in fact, you know, the deer and the turkeys and the ants and all that, they're experiencing this universal system from the limitation of their forms. And so each creature is the center. Now, and this is just pointing to the way it is in terms of here, here and now, <clears throat> Dhamma. <clears throat> now, that, <clears throat> that if we put it into Sakya uh, pattern, then it's like I'm, I'm creating myself as God or, you know, I'm some, you know, I'm the center and you're not. That kind of <laughs> Man, I'm not, I'm not... <laughs> making claims on that level, you know, but just pointing to what life is for, for, for yourselves, why life is this way, uh, you know, why we suffer and why we, you know, we have to bear with all kinds of conditions, changes, the karma of this universal system in both its positive and negative aspects. And we experience it from this point of consciousness. 
So then, then this is the subject-object reality. You know, we, because of the form, having a human body, we, we, the, we can be aware of the objects that arise and cease in consciousness. So, in terms of this uh, moment, you, you, you know, you, you're reflecting on the way it is, on whatever you're feeling, you know, uh, emotional feelings, memories, uh, um, thoughts, views, opinions, fears, desires, and whatever quality, quantity, or whatever, the, that this knowing of them is, is seeing them in terms of all conditions are impermanent. The pe sankara anicca. So this word sankara is a Pali word that includes all conditioned phenomena. Conditions are impermanent, they're anicca, they arise, they cease, they're born and die. So that applies to you know, your own experience here and now. Your thoughts arise and cease. Your emotions arise and cease. Your memories arise and cease. Born and die. Your memories are born and then they die. So there's a dying going on all the time in the human, the human experience. But we don't, uh, you know, we tend to not pay attention to the end of things. We're the desire for becoming is so strong that we're always looking for the next thing. As soon as we uh, get bored or fed up or whatever, we look for the next exciting rebirth. <clears throat> so like looking for happiness, you know, you, we, you know, with the meditation, like what we're doing here, we're actually learning to patiently observe the process of birth and death as it happens in our mind. So that's why you, you know, you're willing to sit through boredom and pain and despair and all these negative states that, that uh, you know, in most cases, most uh, modern uh, situations, people don't. You know, they can't be bothered with it. They've got to, as soon as you feel bored, disinterested, fed up, despairing, disillusioned, you, you seek something else. Either you eat something, switch on the telly, call your friends on the, your cell phone, <laughs> play around with your computers, <laughs> <laughs> surf the internet. There are so many distractions now, so many rebirths. <laughs> that the chance to observe the ending of anything is increasingly more difficult. <laughs> They say in the old days where there wasn't all this, and one did have to say in a cold, long winter, they learn how to bear with, you know, patiently while you're knitting socks or doing something. <laughs> so there's a kind of wisdom developed that comes through patient endurance. But in modern life, well, the, the stress factor is because there's so many immediate distractions. And like you're going to Thailand now, it used to be uh, you go land at the airport in Bangkok and, and as soon as they'd open the door of the airplane, this heat would kind of suddenly overwhelm you, the heat from Bangkok. The plane was air conditioned, they opened the door and then the heat kind of poured in, tropical heat. Now you go and you go through air conditioned passageway, from, they open the door and uh, it's not, uh, you know, you don't get this heat wave and you go into an air-conditioned airport, from an air-conditioned airport to an air-conditioned taxi, from an air-conditioned taxi to an air-conditioned hotel, and then you go on tours in air-conditioned coaches. <laughs> so you don't have to, you, you can always, you know, find uh, this level of comfort that, that we, uh, we demand now. We're more demanding of this as a continuous kind of experience of comfort and ease and, not, and feel irritated when things aren't comfortable, when 
uh, you know, we, the, the aging process, sickness, loss of the love, the, the, the boredom, the disillusionment, all these are part of human experience that we, we tend to ignore or dismiss or resist. So in meditation, like this retreat, is the, you know why we do sit for 45 minutes or walk 45 minutes, things like because it gives us a chance to, to bear with things, to develop a confidence in witnessing and observing. It's not just for Sakya Ditti to make me more patient. You know, I've got, you know, my impatience is a bad thing. I've got to make myself patient. I mean, I used to think like that. But that's still, you know, want, wanting to get something, uh, you know, I see that something wrong with myself and I don't like it, and so I do things to kind of punish myself and make myself better. So this sense of a self, Sakya Ditti, first fetter, Sanyojana in Pali. Now, the, these first three fetters is very, because they are artificial fetters. They're, they're made by human ignorance. Language and cultural conditioning and the ego, the self-view. So they're not like consciousness or the body. The body is tamacha, it's natural. Uh, we didn't create it, and consciousness we didn't create. But we do create ourselves as separate personalities, egos, sakya ditti. <clears throat> so this is, uh, in the, uh, you notice the po political, social, Economic problems all around this uh, this uh, this delusion of a self, cultural attitudes and prejudices, religious biases, views and opinions that um, people have, uh, you know, and 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 believe in, and willing to die for, willing to kill for, because you know to defend democracy against the axis of evil, we're willing to kill to to preserve this sense of democracy. And so this is, this is, this is these are, this is all Sakyaditi Silabhata Bharamasa Vichikecha. So you see our governments and the society is based on ignorance, avicca, not understanding Dhamma. So this word avicca is a Pali word meaning not understanding the, the truth of the way it is. So we operate from the illusions, from the condition attitudes, from prejudices, biases, cultural conditioning, ideals of how things should be. Uh, we, we create ourselves as, uh, you know, fully committed to our personality uh, and viewing ourselves in various ways, positive and negatively. <clears throat> so that's where this, this encouragement to really get to know what Sakya Ditti is in this retreat. You know, say, I am an unenlightened person practicing now in order to become enlightened in the future. I, uh, and as I was saying yesterday, I deliberately create this but I listen to it. My relationship to it is listening, not judging. I'm not, you know, I'm not making any comment about it as good or bad, right or wrong. It's like this, this sense of I am somebody. I am not good enough. I am unenlightened. I need to do something to become enlightened. This is all about the sense of Sakya Ditti, wanting to get something that I, that I think I don't have yet. So if I practice meditation in order to become, I'm operating from Sakya Ditti. And that's why I, now I really try to avoid any kind of reinforcement of Sakya Ditti, in, you know, being a, in a 
teacher's position. You know, trying to tell you how, you know, what's wrong with you or how you should practice or, or you know, get you to, to just reinforce the sense of yourself as this person, this personality with these limitations and then reinforcing your identities with the conditions. So if you notice, my aim during this retreat is not to reinforce Sakiriti, but to encourage you to get to know it. I'm not against it, because it's a part of our conventional way of living with each other, but to see it so it's no longer a fetter, it no longer is the cause of suffering when you see it for what it is. And of course, in terms of Dhamma, what it is, is anicca, dukkha anatta. So this word anatta, non-self, is, uh, is a strange word in the, for most of us in the beginning because uh, we're, we, you know, we believe so much in ourselves. You know, one thing, you know, I remember when I first started meditation, you know, I could see anicca and dukkha quite easily, but anatta, uh, one thing I do know, I'm here. <laughs> I'm this person. And I have these, I feel like this, and this is, this is my, pro- these are my problems. And then for the first couple of months, three months almost, in meditation, I just had anger arise all the time. My anger, you know, I didn't want, this anger. I wanted tranquility and peace. I ordained as a monk to have permanent peace and bliss. <laughs> and the first three months all I got was anger. <laughs> so, you know, then resisting, controlling, trying to get rid of it. Uh, and it wasn't due to anything in the monastery. You know, I wasn't being mistreated or or abused by anybody in the monastery. It was living by myself for the first time, isolated in a little kuti, a little hut, with nothing to do all day. So unresolved emotions started coming up. There was no TV to look at, no telephone, radio, Nobody to talk to. Nobody could speak English there anyway. <laughs> and so, you know, the, you had no very, it, it was very difficult to distract. So you had to sit there and, and just bear with unresolved emotional conditions that had been suppressed for a lifetime. I was about 32 years old at the time. Well, probably many of you have had similar experiences when you find yourself in these, you know, uh, pastoral settings, these forest places with waterfalls, you're expecting bliss, and instead you end up with obsessive thoughts and feelings and and maybe repressed anger or fears start manifesting in the consciousness. But then in terms of Dhamma, we're looking, this is the being, bearing with this, being patient, accepting, welcoming it, in fact. So this sense of welcoming, I found a very a skillful means that I had to develop because my tendency is to resist what I don't like. So I could see this, this really uh, habitual resistance to certain feelings. And a lot of it was real conceit, like, a, I can't be bothered with this, with this silliness, these stupid nonsensical thoughts. You know, because, you know, I'm, I'm an intelligent man, and I can't be bothered with trivia. <laughs> I only deal with real dhamma, serious <laughs> questions, and things of great importance, because I'm such an intelligent, gifted, (laughs) special person. And you listen to yourself go on like that, you realize this is, uh, you know, Sakyaditi, self-view. 
I'm, I'm, I can't waste my time with nonsense and trivia. It's, you know, it's a real sense of I'm, I'm above it all. So you listen and you, you hear your own conceits, pride uh, manifesting, but, the, but don't, it's good, you know, to, to see it, to be the bhutto, seeing it in terms of dhammo, rather than judging and saying, oh, you know, I'm, I shouldn't feel conceited, I shouldn't be proud. We all know what we should or shouldn't be, don't we? That's, that's not a great discovery. But it's, uh, but it's, uh, it's, uh, this is what, what arises. Like, I, I, I always had the idea that I wasn't conceited. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so that was another kind of conceit, wasn't it? I mean, <laughs> So this sense of listening and, and even nonsense because of my pride and my sense of can't be bothered with trivia, nonsense, rubbish. Then a lot of, you know, of 32 years, there's a lot of suppression of things that, you know, I just I can't be bothered with that. That's a stupid thought, can't be bothered with that. That's silly. Don't can't be bothered with that. So this is the resistance. There's always this, can't be bothered, that's silly, that's stupid, can't be bothered, uh, uh, I don't want, I don't want to, I don't want that in my mind and push, resist. So in terms of the second noble truth, this is like, uh, I began to see it in terms of uh, vipavadana, desire to get rid of. Now this was, quite a revelation because I saw, you know, desire is always the word, English word desire usually has a kind of pejorative meaning. Like it is always slightly not, not very good or wholesome to have desires. But um, in, in Pali, the word dhanha translated generally into English as desire. You can have good desires, wanting to be a good person, wanting to become a good person, wanting to uh, help others, wanting to be, become, be altruistic. Uh, you know, these are good desires, noble desires. Some other desires are mean and nasty and, and uh, conceited and, and ugly. But desire is not about, you know, it is an energy. It's, it's not, you know, it's something that arises and ceases according to conditions. So, in the second noble truth, you're, you're investigating desire. Get to know desire, not get rid of it, because that's vipavadana, isn't it? Desire to get rid of desire is, the, is still desire, is still stuck with this. I can't be bothered with these uh, bad desires, so I will ignore them, resist them, suppress them. And then, of course, you pay the price, because what you suppress, you're really reinforcing. And it'll come out sometime. And, you know, we find ourselves suddenly uh, enraged, or somebody doing some trivial thing because we've suppressed anger for so long and then somebody uh, uh, slams the door and we, we blow up. Or we, you know, we're, we're, we're in a situation where we can't distract ourselves. And so fear becomes, we become frightened and paranoid of everything because we've suppressed that. And so even though on the rational level we may realize there's nothing to be afraid of, we say, don't be afraid, there's nothing to be afraid of. You know, that's one way of suppressing again, isn't it? It's just trying to convince yourself there's nothing to fear. But getting to know fear, wanting to get rid of fear is vipavadana. I don't want this, I want to suppress it or get rid of it or ignore it. 
But when there's fear, then it's like this. If I feel frightened by something, it's like this. So I'm welcoming emotions that before I resisted. And wel- welcoming doesn't mean I'm approving or liking them, isn't it? It's not about welcoming because I'm so glad that, that fear has, has come for a visit. <laughs> it's still, you know, it is, fear is like this. So this sense of welcoming is, using this word welcome is, is a skillful means I developed in order to counteract the, the kind of very strong habitual tendency to resist, to suppress, to push away or ignore. So that could be like, emotions like fear, or it just can be nonsense and stupidity and triviality. Because I noticed in the, you know, that sometimes there would be just utter nonsense going on in my head. You know, just silly things, stupid thoughts, rubbish. You know, and you think, where is this coming from? You know, what what's wrong with me that I I'm here sitting here meditating and, and then suddenly all this nonsense, rubbish, stupidity, silly things, absurdities start coming in. And I can't be bothered. Then I see this, this desire to, can't be bothered, you know, get, get away from it. Or maybe I've spent a lifetime resisting stupid thoughts, rubbish and nonsense. And so then in the meditation, seeing this, these, these emotions that have been resisted or suppressed start becoming, appearing into consciousness. So this sense of welcoming them. So it's like when, when you can welcome something, you're allowing it to be what it is. You're, it's, no, it's an unconditional welcome. There's no conditions attached. You're willing to accept the condition in its totality without making any bargains with it or spe- demanding anything from it, just, just allowing it to be what it is. And then you, you, you will, if you begin to trust this, you, you, you begin to notice its uh, cessation. Then this way, because you're willing, allowing stupidity or fear or these things to be conscious unconditionally, then then you then you will begin to also recognize that they're changing, they're nicha dukkha nata, and that they, and their absence when they cease. So this is like panya, or wisdom, discerning the, the, the arising and ceasing of conditions. So when there's some questions here about sound of silence. So I found that this sound of silence practice gives this, uh, allows this continuous uh, mindfulness, a, a kind of sustaining mindfulness with the sound of silence, which welcomes everything. It's not, sound of silence is not a noise that hides things or suppresses anything. You can hear it behind all kinds of noise, music. And, uh, and I've trained myself to even in, like in the Amravati, the, we have a lot of, uh, grass to cut, you know, lawns to mow. And we have these, uh, uh, you know, these lawnmowers that make a lot of noise. So I can hear the sound of silence. And then I don't develop irritation towards the lawnmower. A lot of the monks and nuns do. They just get irritated by noise. But, uh, and I used to also, but I, I see it as an opportunity 
to to uh, to really to, to pay attention, so that I'm not being caught up in my aversion to uh, the sound of the lawnmower. Now, in the developing this sound of silence, it's the attitude. It's not, not the danger always in talking about it is that. You, you imagine it, you kind of conceive it as something, and then you start looking for what you're conceiving. So the, even the word sound is, is kind of misleading because uh, it's, um, you know, you think of it as like music, or maybe you're looking for the uh, angelic chorus, <laughs> something like that, where angels start, start singing, or harp music. You know, like something pleasant like that. But, uh, you know, you think of the cosmic vibration. Then you're, then you're conceiving it as something very special, you know, and very refined. So naming it even is, is a, is, you know, is, uh, the naming is merely a pointing. It's not a description. It's not a definition. So when I use this sound of silence, the word sound of silence, it, it's not a description of anything. It's merely a, a words that point, or hopefully uh, help you to recognize it. So to recognize this is just opening. This is, if you're looking for it, you'll never find it. You, you just recognize it. So it's an attitude of relaxed attention, openness. Listening, receiving, these words. And then you might hear kind of like a, a kind of high, higher pitch, um, vibration or sound, whatever way you want to describe it. Now some people experience in different ways, so I'm just telling you about my experience, because that's what I know. But the, uh, uh, also it's, it's, this is, the attitude is, is the important thing, not the sound of silence, it's a kind of attainment. You know, I've got to get it. Uh, be observant of how you know your how you create a desire to get it. it when, because I'm talking about as if it's uh, you know really something important, so you 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 want to get it. Notice this desire to get something you don't have. So in this uh, uh, the second noble truth. The, the desire for becoming, trying to get something you don't have. Wanting peace and tranquility when you're, when you're confused and, and, and fraught. Wanting to get rid of your chattering mind, your obsessions, your emotional uh, fears and desires. Wanting to get rid of them is like this. So, like listening, this desire to resist. I've studied this so so thoroughly. This this tendency to resist life, this pushing away what I don't, what I can't be bothered with, or what I'm frightened of, or don't want. This pushing, resisting is like this. And suddenly I see it. There's awareness, and then I see this this kind of this feeling of want, not wanting to get rid of something I don't like. Recognizing that that's Whipple would done. The, the value of the Pali Buddhist tradition is that it gives you really good vocabulary to use. It's not, it's not modern psychology or, or science. It's quite skillful. Uh, vocabulary, poly, poly teachings like the Four Noble Truths, the uh, 
dependent origination is something really worthy to, to use. Or this uh, ten fetters and four stages. So the four stages, stream entry, we make a big deal about that. How many of you are Sotapanas, you know? And are there any arahants in the room? Some of you have been meditating for years. What, what are you, a Sakadakami or an Anakami? I mean, people come to me and ask me these questions. <laughs> what have you attained, Ajahn Tomato? Are you a stream enterer yet? Or an Arahant? I haven't attained anything. Now that is, is like, uh, you know, that's, oh, I mean you spent 42 years of your life, your, your youth is gone, you're an old, old man and, 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 you know, celibate for 42 years and you've just got nothing for it. What a disappointment. And that, or you haven't attained anything. But this is, this is why that, that way of thinking doesn't work anymore. It's not about attaining. These words are dangerous, uh, attaining and achieving. Because they do, they are reinforcing Sakya Ditti. Because my ego, my sense of my self-importance depends on success, on attainment, on achievement. You know, have, spending 42 years in the monastic life I've attained something. You know, I've really, you know, gotten something out of it. I've really, uh, you know, I think I'm an arahant, you know? <laughs> and uh, at least I hope I am, maybe, I'm not sure yet. <laughs> but the ego will, you know, is like that. It's about, you know, I want to get something I don't have yet. I want to to, uh, you know, achieve something. I want to be successful. I don't want to be a failure. These are worldly dhammas, isn't it? To, in the States, in America, to be a failure is really, you know, that's what we dread. Being a failure is like worthless person, failure. And we, we, we worship success. How successful is your monastery? How many monks do you have? How many nuns do you have? How many people come? How many branch monasteries? Oh, you're successful, I say. I say you're very successful. And, and this is, uh, you know, this, this is because success is the way the world thinks, success or failure. But in uh, Dhamma, it's not about success or failure. It's about letting go, relinquishing, understanding. And so, you know, your, you know, the consciousness is not something I, you know, I'm, it's not mine. When, it, when I'm, when there's mindfulness, satisampachanya, the sense of me as a separate person it arises and ceases in that consciousness. Because I don't sustain it, I don't try to hold on to this sense of me as somebody, a person that's attained or has achieved or failed at anything. It doesn't apply anymore. It's not about me attaining stream entry or becoming an arahant. These are merely conventions to help you to reflect on your own, on the reality of your own life. But they're not meant to be Sakyaditi, because Sakyaditi is the first fetter that blocks off stream entry. So anyone that goes around announcing they're a stream enterer, I wouldn't trust. <laughs> not to mention an arahant, because uh, you know when you know you can overestimate your ego will you know will you know can really delude. Mine can is. Very deceitful ego I have. I don't trust it. It lies. It tells lies. My ego does. So it's untrustworthy. But this awareness then is, uh, is not about, 
you know, me uh, as being specially gifted with awareness, it's natural. It's recognizing real, it's real. It's anatta. It's not sakya ditti. So, anatta, no self, is this. It's this pure awareness. And so it's, it transcends your thinking process. So when you try to figure it out, you'll, you'll get uh, yourself into a confused state. Because thinking will just cause doubt. And am I really? Is, I, is this really a not or am I, have I got it wrong? Maybe I'm just fooling myself. Maybe I just believe that I don't have a self. When maybe I really do, I'm just deluding myself. I, I want to feel I've gotten something out of 42 years, so I, I'm trying to, you know, I'm modest, and I feel I'm quite a modest person, so I'm not going to make great claims. So, you know, I've heard monks and nuns do their thing. Well, you know, I haven't really, you know, but I'm still one of the Batuchinas. That means a totally unenlightened person. So they, they think that False modesty is, is uh, better. <laughs> but it's another lie. It's another deceit, another sakya ditti. You know, I've just, I've just become a nicer person. I'm more content and, and a little happier than I used to be. And it's very modest, very English. <laughs> So it's, uh, but it's still Sakya Ditti. So notice like, like Sakya Ditti is, you create it with thought. I am, I am this body. This is my body. I am American. I am Ajahn Sumato. I'm a Buddhist monk. I'm a Theravadan Buddhist monk. I, my teacher is Ajahn Chah. And I'm, disciple of Ajahn Chah, and I'm, it goes on and on, this is mine, me and mine, and, and but you can listen to this, you, you're the observer of this sense of I am this way, I want to become something, I want to get rid of something, is like this. So these three categories of desire I found ex- extremely helpful to, to begin to just notice what it is. Because we can operate in meditation with vipa vadana. Bhavadana, vipa vadana. Desire to attain uh, jhanas, uh, good concentration, absorptions, desire to, to achieve uh, sotapanna, uh, sakadakami uh, anagami arahant, wanting to become a bodhisattva or a Buddha or whatever. There's all kinds of altruistic things, you know, objects that one can want to become. Now, it's not that this is wrong, but it is still bhavadana. I'm not a bodhisattva. I'm still self-centered, and, uh, but I hope in this lifetime to purify myself enough so I can become a bodhisattva. What is that? What is that? That's, that I am, you know, so far I'm not this, but I hope to become this in the future. Or maybe in the ne- next lifetime, if I keep all the precepts and practice hard, I might, hoping to be reborn as a bodhisattva in the next life. And I know Buddhists that want to become Buddhas, the next Maitreya Buddha. They hope they're spending this life doing good works, which is admirable. It's not, not, not to be disparaged, but they still miss the point of the, the directness of the Buddha Dhamma. So the altruistic goals and the, uh, and the sense of yourself as you know, and you may, you know, to be a bodhisattva, you can't be selfish. 
everything, the last blade of grass is, is you're willing to put off a uh, final nirvana until the last blade of grass is enlightened. Well, that is incredibly unselfish, isn't it? Especially when you live at Amrabati where there's grass everywhere. <laughs> I mean, <it's> a... <laughs> so... <laughs> but the, um... you know, that, but, and so then when we do feel selfish, we feel guilty, you know. I hate myself because I'm, you know, I have these selfish moments. And I just hate it, you know, I can't stand myself. Uh, I'm so ashamed of myself because sometimes I'm not all that good, you know, I'm not thinking about the last blade of grass, I'm thinking about me. <laughs> and in maybe a very selfish way. And, and uh, heck with the rest of you. <laughs> now that also, you know, whether it's selfish or altruistic, this is a creation of the mind, isn't it? It's a judgment. The altruism is beautiful, selfishness is not. So this is a value judgment. What's beautiful and altruistic and what is mean, uh, selfish, and, and you should be ashamed of it, is like this. Now these are awareness of these conditions. These are conditions. When you're feeling, you know, in your grand magnanimous form to, to sacrifice everything until the last blade of grass is enlightened, uh, the conditions for that kind of magnanimity of present, you're feeling may be good. But then life changes and, and things go wrong and things fall away and, and, and it brings maybe very selfish feelings up into consciousness. So in terms of, you know, see, uh, contemplating Dhamma, the Buddha knows the way it is. All conditions are impermanent, whether they're beautiful and grand, magnanimous, or mean, selfish, and nasty. All conditions are seen in this way of anicca, dukkha, and anatta. So they call the three characteristics of existence. Uh, because these... These three characters are common to all conditions, whether, you know, it's, it's beautiful and refined or coarse and ugly. From the, the physical body, the planet, the earth, the, the, you know, the gross elements to the most refined levels of, of concentration. Anything that, the, the all conditions that conditions depend on other conditions for their presence. And when the conditions change, then, then uh, say, supporting a magnanimous uh, state of mind, then you can't sustain it. You can't sustain that as an ongoing, permanent state of, of consciousness. But what is self-sustaining, that you don't sustain through will or desire, is awareness. So this awareness then is recognizable. Now what I developed over the years as the sound of silence is, is really recognizing it and then sustaining it like, like floating on a stream, maybe counting to five with a, with, while listening to the sound of silence. Like a one, two, three, and I'm listening to the sound of silence. It's a way of keeping the mind focused on this, or mala beads, you can use mala beads, you know, one bead, sound of silence, and things like that, ways of, I, I have notebooks in my uh, kuti, I've just written, you know, pages written, silent, silent, silent. Or buto, 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 and just you know. But each each time I write the word silence, I'm listening on this sound of silence. So this is one way of of beginning to recognize, sustaining this 
that we kept learning to rest in it, to open to it. So it becomes, it's a natural state. And then no matter how many times you get, lose it and get carried away with, with your emotions or thoughts or anything, you, you have this, this remembering, you know, sound of silence. And then through the years, this, this becomes stable. The, the still point, it's, it's like it's uh, stabilized. It's just natural state that you don't, you know, you notice at any moment. It's recognizable all the time. So even now as I'm talking, I can, I'm aware of this sound of silence. It doesn't stop me from talking. It's not like concentrating on an object where you have to shut down and focus on one thing. This has this expansive uh, sense of embracing life. So it, it's whether you're washing the dishes or walking jongram or whatever, you're, this is still the, this uh, sense of stillness is ever present. Now the, this, uh, since there's the person, like this personality is, uh, you know, your personality changes according to the conditions. You know, whether the sun's out or it's cold and wet, or whether you're feeling healthy or you're feeling sick. Or you've had good news that you've won the lottery, or you've heard bad news that you've lost your fortune and you have to go bankrupt. You know, you, your, your personality will change accordingly. And so today I'm happy, tomorrow I'm miserable. And so, the, and this is what we call itabajyata in Pali, with, uh, it's dependent. Conditions, how you feel, the conditions are dependent on other conditions. But this is the unconditioned, this awareness, the gate to the deathless is open. So, this awareness, this is a simple gap where we suddenly stop just going around with our thoughts and habits. We stop and just listen. This is the gate to the deathless. The unconditioned, the unborn. And this, this, this deathless is, doesn't, it is, is the background. It's not, it doesn't cancel out anything. It doesn't suppress anything. It's not about, it embraces everything. It in, it's all inclusive, it's unconditioned. It's metta, unconditioned love. It's, it's uncritical. Like with metta practice, isn't it? You, it it's, a, it's, develop, it's cultivating uncriticalness. You have metta for every, all sentient beings. It's not more metta for the good ones than only a little for the bad ones. It's not you deciding how much of your metta is going to your friends. And maybe you can spare a couple of percent of your metta for the people you can't stand. That's, <laughs> that's conditioned, isn't it? Uh, it, it? Metta, in this is a loving kindness, is really non-critical, accepting, allowing a condition, whatever, its quality to be what it is. Unconditioned love. So in this word love also is, uh, is the basis of everything. You begin to recognize that, that if there was no love, there, nothing, would, there, it, nothing would hold together. You know, just like when there is no love, when you feel no love and you just criticize, everything becomes very separate and falls apart. You know, you feel threatened, you feel self-conscious, you feel 
worrying about, you worry about the future. You're anxious. Uh, you're, you're wanting to control everything so because it's too frightening to lose control, to allow things to be what they are. You've got to sort everything out so that only what you like is you allow into your consciousness. This is fear, and this is division, this is not love. And so you live in a realm of fear and self, self-control and, and a, become a, a control freak. You're afraid of losing control. So in this way, this, uh, this uh, awareness, the gate to the deathless is the door, the gap in the samsara that transcends the samsara, where we can see the samsara or the condition phenomena in this way of loving kindness, metta, or with awareness, allowing conditions to be what they are, whether they're external, allowing other people to be the way they are. How many of you, you know, always have conditions about other people? You want somebody to be other than what they are. You want the society, you want some, uh, the uh, spirit rock, or you want something to be something else. You can imagine it better than the way it is. Or, so, you know, in the mon- monastery, uh, you have to live with people who, you know, you personally may not like very much. <laughs> but, the, uh, but then this, this metta is allowing people, individuals, to be what they are. It's not conditioned. Uh, I'll let you become a monk or a nun if you... If you change your ways and, and live your life so that you do not upset me anymore. <laughs> so it's like, you know, you're, you're coming from this self-controlling, uh, centered personality to this expansion, all-inclusive, you know, uh, but relating to all conditioned phenomena with welcoming and understanding, with metta. And that's mindfulness. Sati sampachanya sati panya. So uh, this evening, that's enough for this evening. and. Uh, Offer this for your reflection. The Lord, the perfectly enlightened and blessed one, I render homage to the Buddha, the blessed one. The teaching so completely explained by him, I bow to the Dhamma. The Blessed One's disciples who have practiced well, I bow to the Sangha.